Good evening. My name is Renee Nicholson and as the director of the Humanities Center here at West Virginia University, I'm very pleased to welcome you to tonight's event, Public Matters, the 2020-2021 Humanities Center grantees. Tonight's event celebrates the critical and vibrant work of humanities research from across our university and will be hosted by my wonderful colleague, friend, and the center's associate director, Dr. Rhonda Raymond. But before I turn things over to Rhonda and our guests, just a little bit of housekeeping. Today's talk is being hosted on the Zoom webinar platform. And my guess is, is that most of you are very familiar with Zoom webinar events. But just in case, tonight's event will be recorded and posted on the center's YouTube channel. We invite you to ask questions for tonight's fellows and collaborative grant awardees using the Q&A function. At the end of the presentations, Rhonda will ask these questions as time allows, uh, and only questions that are answered will be made public. The chat function is not enabled for participants. At this point, I'd like to turn over public matters to Dr. Rhonda Raymond. Thank you, Renee. And let me get my notes up here. Just one moment, and I'd like to welcome everyone here tonight. Thank you so much, and thank you to our panelists. And um, the first thing I'd like to do is to um, read the Indigenous Land Acknowledgement. WVU, with its statewide institutional presence, resides on land that includes ancestral territories of the Shawnee, Lenape, or Delaware, um, um, how does Shawnee, Seneca, Cayuga, Onondaga, Oneida, Mohawk, Tuscarora, and Cherokee and other indigenous peoples. In acknowledging this, we recognize and appreciate that these indigenous nations whose territories we are living on and working in, indigenous peoples have been in the land currently known as West Virginia since time immemorial. It is important that we understand both that context that has brought our university community to reside on this land and our place within this long history. We also recognize that colonialism is a current ongoing process. And as scholars seeking truth and understanding, we need to be mindful of our present participation in this process. Thank you so much for being here tonight. We know it's a busy time of the year and week filled with major announcer, announcements and research events. Five of these event, events have been co-hosted or hosted by the Humanities Center. On Monday, we heard from some of the best and brightest undergraduate humanities scholars who presented their Honors Excel projects. We anticipate this becoming an annual event and encourage all of you to support the students by being mentors um, and to join and watch these projects um, next year. On the faculty side of research in the long form scholarship event, um, which is online at the um, provost's um, Provost site, there are eight books by Humanities Center affiliates, plus three more by unaffiliated humanities scholars at the university. This means that the humanities this year comprise more than a third of the entries. So go humanities, doing some wonderful things. In addition to the grantees whose projects you'll hear about tonight, the center also supported seven projects through its life in the time of COVID-19 grants. The range and reach of these projects are impressive, from our classrooms to our libraries uh, on the main campus and Potomac State, to work in Scotts Run in Raynell, West Virginia, to an Amish community in Ohio. With the help of early funding from the Humanities Center, this last research group was able to collect and interpret enough data to secure a nearly quarter of a million dollar National Science Foundation or NSF grant. You can check out these tremendous projects by going to our YouTube site and, uh, or I should say channel, and watching each group that discusses their research in our short talks videos of between 10 and 20 minutes. So um, nice little break that you can take those in short chunks. Yesterday, we heard from Andrew Vosco, um, who discussed deconstructing academic silos and boundaries between um, the academy and communities beyond to create transdisciplinary research groups to solve complex or wicked societal problems. 
the Humanities Center brings together people from across colleges, institutes, centers, and other campus community partners. The Center and Humanities and Humanities adjacent scholars at WVU are already doing this vital work in the present and on the cusp of the future. We're using the deep expertise of unidisciplinary scholarship in both multidisciplinary and interdisciplinary collaborations and our indispensable partners in transdisciplinary work that will be ever more necessary. All of our presenters tonight, even those engaged in the famously solitary endeavor of writing books are actively collaborating with wider communities. Their work demonstrates how important the humanities are to public matters and that they matter to the public. So our first two presenters of the evening will be our Humanities Center fellows. And then we will um, have our, uh, those that have um, been awarded our collaborative grants will be following that. So our first presenter of the evening is Sarah Morris in the Department of English, and she'll be talking on transformation, translation, and complication. Take me home, country roads. Sarah. Hello, everyone. Let me just share my screen. All right. So welcome. As you may know, this week marks the 50th anniversary of the release of Take Me Home, Country Roads. And like many West Virginians, I've known and heard this song my entire life, but I have a complicated relationship with it. You probably do too. So for the next 10 minutes or so, I want us to think about Country Roads as a cultural artifact and a rhetorical text that's used as a marker of identity, an emblem of community and more locally and globally. So the scope of my project explores the way that Country Roads is taken up as a marker of identity and a call to home, not just for West Virginians, but for people all over the world. I wondered how it came to be that way and why. These are some of the questions that I'm seeking to answer. I do want to qualify that I am not a musicologist. My area of research is centered specifically in rhetoric and composition studies. I'm an interpretive researcher and I'm trained in human science phenomenology. So I look to find existential intersubjective understanding through research that captures lived experience with an orientation toward teaching and learning. I've used text analysis, reflective writing, a public survey, interviews and digital ethnography to find research themes in this project. I contend that there's a set of conditions that contribute to Country Roads as a phenomenon rather than just a song, and those relate to marketing, social and cultural meanings, identity rhetoric, and maybe a little magic, but less than the folklore seems to suggest. I want to talk about some of what I've learned, um, and through this short presentation, I can't possibly address it all. So one of the interesting aspects of Take Me Home Country Roads is the origin story or the mythology around the origins. For example, many people have told me about impossible 1960s encounters with John Denver in West Virginia that speak to his deep love of the state. Um, other folks are adamant that none of the songwriters had any West Virginia connections at all. When I spoke with Bill Danoff and Taffy Nivert, as well as others who were fans of theirs in the late 60s and early 70s, what I learned was much more complicated. The songwriters did have at least some peripheral connections to West Virginia, and Denver had a smaller part in the song's origins than we assume. Danoff and Nivert had been performing versions of the song prior to sharing it with Denver. And with him, they modified the bridge and replaced a verse, but otherwise the song was intact. From there, the three recorded it together and it was an almost instant hit. In my surveys and interviews, people report having heard country roads all over the world. I've had this experience myself and you probably have too if you've traveled. The song taps into this kind of universal longing for home and belonging. Taffy Nivert described it to me as a little bird that had flown all over the world and taken on a life of its own. She attributes its popularity to its simplicity and the way that it develops a primal harmony and chord pattern, but much of this popularity is really due to marketing. 
There were immediately many cover versions of the song. Bill Danoff told me that when RCA realized they had a hit and wanted to release it worldwide, they immediately began distributing it to other artists, among whom were Lynn Anderson, who had a hit um, on the country charts, Olivia Newton-John and Ray Charles. And from there, the song rippled out to different genres and audiences and artists like Toots and the Maytals, who took up the Ray Charles version, not the John Denver version, or the many Asian and European recordings which were influenced by Olivia Newton-John rather than John Denver. So we can trace the lineage of the song across the globe this way, through nearly 300 recorded versions in English in the last 50 years and variations in more than 20 other languages. All tributes to home, sometimes that home was West Virginia, but not always. Here in West Virginia, WVU jumped on the marketing potential buying the rights in 1972, so just a year after the song's release. Country Roads is ever present on campus even since then. So the Carillon Bells at the Alumni Center in celebrations in recruitment, graduations, and of course in sports. There are references all around us. It's part of our language and our culture. Students take it up as a marker of home and community. References adorn their laptops, their clothes, their cars, their graduation mortarboards, and even their bodies. It represents a tellable narrative that taps into a sense of created community and shared place here at WVU. But there was a warm reception throughout West Virginia immediately also. This clipping from the Charleston Daily Mail documents Denver's performance of the song on the Capitol steps in Charleston in August of 1971, just a few months after the song's release. One person who was there told me that there were thousands of people, so many that Canal Boulevard was closed for the day and that the crowd just went wild over John Denver and his song. Maybe the most interesting thing about this news article though is that it prints the lyrics in their entirety so that all West Virginians could learn the words. West Virginians loved this song from the moment that it was released. And as a state, we'd suffered out migration for some time. This was compounded by devastating losses of soldiers in Vietnam. Homesickness and longing were a mood and gen generally country roads put words and melody to what folks were already feeling. So there was a renewed interest in Appalachia in the 60s as well. And in this cultural context where West Virginians were typically portrayed negatively, Country Roads spoke, and I think still speaks, a positive image in the face of demeaning stereotypes. So it represents this virtue of almost heaven as a place of belonging, no matter who you are. When we face the ugliness of what they say about us, we can cue Country Roads and suddenly we're recognizable as something besides poor hillbillies. But, <laughs> The West Virginia represented and Country Roads is idealized at best. West Virginia songwriter Todd Burge told me that despite hundreds of requests for it over the years, he's never learned it. My survey research revealed that many respondents knew no other songs about West Virginia, and most of those who did knew the West Virginia Hills, which is our first state song. I wondered why Country Roads, when there are so many West Virginian songwriters who portray us more clearly, more complexly, and more accurately. Travis Steinling's work demonstrates that West Virginian musicians don't generally write the kind of simple love letter that Country Roads is. Um, the songs on this slide are just three of my favorites, but there are of course many more that we could discuss, songs that present a closer reality than Country Roads. So my research has confirmed a lot of what I already knew about West Virginians and how we take up this song. We play it at family gatherings, around campfires, at parties. Uh, when we cross the state line coming home from vacation, we request it in bars when there's a band playing. We sing it at graduations, proms, weddings, even funerals. All the while, we know that it's not entirely accurate. Country Roads is the imagined place maybe we wish we were. It's also part of a long tradition of writing about Appalachia rather than writing from Appalachia. 
which lines up with all the other ways that were affected by extraction and imposed definitions. It's the simplistic version of shared homesickness told from far away by people who imagine a space, but that imagination aligns just enough with reality that it reflects back at us like a magic mirror. This is facilitated by a global music industry that amplifies some voices and overpowers others. One theme that I've uncovered as I've worked on this project is the necessity of engaging with the difficult story or the truer story. So this is the place where we come to the implications for teaching and learning. Emily Satterwhite tells us that there is a danger in the insider-outsider dichotomy. This can lead us to simply fully embrace or fully reject country roads as a description of West Virginia and its people. Uh, we can love country roads and recognize its capacity to sugarcoat and simplify, and we can speak closer truths in the same breath. So part of the impact of this work is to engage with these counter stories alongside country roads as texts that portray the complexity of who we are. I'm grateful that the West Virginia University Humanities Center provided me with the time and funding to do this work. It's led me to interviews, explorations, and conversations that I would not have otherwise had. I'm still collecting thoughts from songwriters, storytellers, and West Virginians, and I'd love to hear your stories and theories. So you can feel free to send me an email or answer my survey. It's linked and the QR code is here, and I'm happy to share my slides as well. Thank you for listening, and I hope we can continue the conversation. Thank you so much, Sarah. It's wonderful. Thank you. And our, our next presenter of the evening is our second fellow for the year, and that's Karen Kalkasi in uh, the Department of Geology and Geography. And she will be speaking about her project, another book project, which is called Displacing Territory, Palestinian and Syrian Refugees in Jordan. And Karen, it's all, all yours. Right. So my share screen doesn't seem to be working now. It was before. We tested this and it worked just fine. But now when I hit share screen, I'm just getting a blank box. I've never seen this happen before. <laughs> um, let's see. If we can figure out how to. It's very bizarre. Yes. I think I see it now. Oh, OK. Oh. Wow, that was really weird. Well, that's somebody else. Oops. That's not actually my screen. You've shared your notes, Renee. Somehow that was Renee's screen. Yeah. That was what is going on? Strange. Okay, we got it now. This is it. This is the correct All right. All right. Fabulous. Okay. All right. Sorry about that there. All right. Well, thank you, um, everybody, and good evening. And I don't know why I'm so incredibly whitewashed and like glowing, illuminating. So I don't usually really look like that, but <laughs> I don't know what's going on to the lighting in my room. But yeah, <laughs> I apologize for that. Um, so I also, like Rhonda, wanted to take a moment to uh, recognize uh, the land and do a, give a land acknowledgement for the many indigenous people that have um, lived in this land well before uh, European white settlers came here. So she already did that beautifully and, and, and said the whole thing. So I'd just like to, you know, reiterate the importance of us recognizing that um, and also to really emphasize that it's crucially important for me, as I'm sure many of you, that we recognize the continued effects of settler colonialism today and that many of us, particularly those of us with European ancestry, we really continue to benefit from that today and that we need to be not just recognizing, but also actively working towards correcting some of these injustices. Um, and when uh, I'm also talking about forced displacement and territorial displacement um, in other areas of the world, um, those connections are intimately related. Um, so it's important, you know, very important to recognize this as a process and a thing that happens globally as well. Um, so let me just start by providing a little bit of context about um, global force displacement. Um, as this chart from the UNHCR is indicating, we currently have 79.5 million displaced people worldwide. This is the highest number 
ever recorded. And it's been that way since 2016. It keeps going up and up and up. Prior to that, the highest number ever recorded was during World War II. And these are people from uh, really across the globe who have been forced from their homes and their communities due to violence and persecution. And we hear a lot about this. Most of the media attention and even public debates have very much um, ensued over the humanitarian and the political issues over forced displacement. And through these discussions and the representations of them, we're hearing greatly about what's happening in the wealthy global North countries. We've learned a lot about what's happened in the US at the US-Mexico border. We heard a lot 2016, 2017 about the European crisis. We've heard lots about Australia and Italy and the troubles that, that these countries been having around the Mediterranean. And this is important, of course, I'm not trying to uh, dwindle the importance of understanding what's happening in these global, wealthy global North countries, but only 20% of all forced, forcibly displaced people or refugees are actually in the global North, okay, which basically means that 80% of all displaced peoples and refugees are in the global south. And I, mean, I use those terms as very, very broad terms, which I know can be a bit problematic, but I prefer them over using developed and um, undeveloped. So what I'm doing um, in my book project, which is kind of loosely titled Displacing Territory, Imaginings of Territory and Belonging for Palestinian and Syrian Refugees in Jordan. So what I'm doing is I'm providing a very detailed, well, I hope it's very detailed study um, that contributes to these public discussions on global global displacement, but by specifically refocusing our attention towards lesser studied global South countries, and particularly one that is dealing with an extraordinary humanitarian and refugee issues. And that is the country of Jordan, as I mentioned just in passing there. Um, and Jordan is indeed extraordinary in their experiences as well as their practices in dealing with forced displacement and refugees. Um, it's, it was established just 100 years ago. It's actually not even a 100-year-old country yet. Um, but during this time, the Kingdom of Jordan has had an incredible, impressive, and sustained history of accepting refugees. As a result today, Jordan has an incredible diversity of refugees and the second highest refugee population per capita in the world. Neighboring Lebanon is the highest and Jordan is the second. With a total population in Jordan of uh, 10 million people, approximately half of all of Jordan's population are Palestinian refugees. Jordan now is hosting more than 655,000 registered Syrian refugees, but the unofficial number is closer to 1.3 million. That's because a lot of Syrians have actually chosen not to register with the UNHCR. Jordan has also hosted tens of thousands of Iraqi refugees. They came first when the US invaded Iraq in 2003, and then they came in a second wave more recently with the rise of Daesh, or what's known as ISIS. So what you're seeing here in the photographs, I'm um, just giving you a really quick glimpse into some of what um, some geographers often refer to as a campscape, um, which is the wider kind of broader um, effects of camps and refugees more broadly across a particular landscape. So I could show you hundreds of pictures of uh, Jordan's kind of refugee landscape, but here's just two to kind of illustrate the diversity that you see in Jordan. Uh, the photograph on the left is the Al-Hussein um, refugee, Palestinian refugee camp. It was established in 1967. That was the second wave of Palestinian refugees that Jordan had accepted. Um, it, this particular refugee camp. Um, you can see it's mostly made of two-story concrete buildings. Um, it hosts about just under 30,000 people live in here and nearly all of them are Palestinian. There are some there, there are some other people who have moved in over the years, but they're mostly Palestinian. Um, it's an open camp though. It's not um, securitized. There are no fences, there are no gates, there's no security officials monitoring who's coming and going. It's a very open part. And because the Palestinian camps have been here for so long in Jordan, they've really become integrated parts of the larger Jordanian society in Jordan dating politics and economy as well. The photograph on the right um, is a kind of an interesting story here. This is a tent, a UNHCR issued official refugee, um, refugee camp tent that was actually smuggled out of the Zatri Syrian refugee camp. Now the Zatri camp was established in the summer of 2014 for the Syrians that were fleeing um, their country into Jordan for safety. Um, the Zatri camp was established very quickly kind of <laughs> without a lot of planning um, to help try to accommodate some of these refugees. Um, and it was fully 
really with tents like this at first and slowly over the years this has been converted into more of these um prefabricated uh kind of they call them caravans and there's like tiny little little homes um so somebody smuggled this out this is actually a very common practice someone smuggled this tent out of zatri refugee camp and zatri unlike al Hussein here that you see in the other photograph is a highly securitized basically open air prison um refugees do not have the freedom of mobility to go in and out of zatri so it's incredibly different situation between the Palestinian and Syrian refugees in Jordan. Um, nevertheless, some people get out, which is why I use the term smuggled, because this tent was taken out illegally. Um, and then this family, this, the Syrian family, who, um, found a Jordanian sponsor who basically allowed them to stay in their yard. Um, so this is a this is a very large home um, on the outskirts of the second largest town in Jordan named Erebid. And the Syrian family um, basically just, you know, staked up their tent and have been living there um, because the conditions of the camp were so deplorable. Um, so again, this is just a, a little glimpse. It's a lot, lot more complicated, but so refugees live in camps, live outside of camps, or Palestinians, or Syrian, or Iraqi, there's incredible amounts of diversity there. And I did not start a timer when I started here, so I do not know where I am. Please let me know if I'm going too long here, Rhonda. So I'm approaching um, my work from, I really don't know how to label myself, but this one seems to fit right now, um, as a post-colonial feminist human geographer. Um, and during this, through my research, what I'm focusing on is I'm looking at these intersections of spatial discourses and people's daily experiences, but with the very specific goal of disrupting Western discourses and norms. So Deepas Chakrabaki um, has been very influential to me um, in his fantastic book, Provincializing Europe, which came out in 2000. He writes about how a Eurocentric history of thought and of practice have universalized normalized and nearly erase alternative views and histories of territory. He goes on a little bit later to say, there are many ways of being in the world. So drawing from these ideas from this kind of post-colonial as well as feminist framings, I focus my work specifically, and this is just one aspect of it, but it really is kind of a, the larger kind of conceptual framework for the book about territorial imaginings. Okay? And there's some very specific reasons why I focus on a territorial imagining, but I ask specifically one aspect of my book is how Syrians and Palestinians literally imagine territory that they're in and that they've moved from. And I believe that territory is an absolute key thing to study when you're looking at global force displacement and refugees, because the basic idea of territory is found, the idea of territory is foundational in all of the international laws regarding refugees. So using this post-colonial and kind of feminist lens, my work is questioning the Western-based dominant ideas and practices of territory as they relate to displacement. And what I found is, well, lots of different things I'm going to focus specifically on here for the next few minutes, is that the Palestinian and Syrian refugees that I've interviewed, which were in the, just about 100 or so, um, in Jordan, imagined territory in many different ways. It was not uniform. There was no singular way they imagined territory. There were many different ways. And these imaginings actually have a real effect on their senses of belonging and their experiences of displacement, including their choices about where to migrate and where to settle. Now, again, as I kind of indicated a moment ago, there were diverse types of imaginings, but there are also a lot of similarities, very notable similarities and quite important ones. So what I do here for the next few minutes, as long as I still have enough time, is give you one example, a historical geographical example that demonstrates how their imaginings are actually very unhinged from what we think of as our kind of Western or modern territorial states. And by doing this, we see that there's another way that people actually do imagine the political divisions of the world, or as Charter Baraki said more eloquently, that there are other ways of imagining how one is being in the world. So I'm going to start with a tiny little bit of background, um, bringing me to World War I. Um, between about 1916 and 1923, there was a series of different negotiations, primarily through by the British and the French, the Russians a little bit, the Italians a little bit as well, um, including the rather kind of infamous Sykes-Picot Agreement that basically led to the British and the French dividing up what was once the very united Arab lands of the Ottoman Empire into their own new mandated state. So what mandated states really actually meant was these were new quasi colonies that the British and the French were creating. And by doing this, they set into action a process that leads directly to the creation of the modern Western territorial states that we know of today as being Syria, Lebanon, Israel, Palestine, 
Iraq, and Jordan. So as um, a very uh, popular and well-known historical geographer, Stuart Eldon has said that these divisions of the Ottoman Empire that by the British and French radically altered pre-existing spatial and territorial divisions of governance, which were under the Ottomans, zonal, overlapping, nomadic, and fluid. So this was a major change and disruption in how that area of the world was thought of and actually divided. So Bilal al-Shamp is um, a perfect example of this. I'm just going to focus on this example here. Uh, Bilal al -Sham is translated more or less as Greater Syria. And this kind of vague region, which you see in green on the map here, had existed for hundreds and hundreds of years before the fall of the Ottoman Empire. It was always a bit of a vague region. In this map that you're looking at here, it's not vague. It's very clearly demarcated. And I will note that this is actually a, kind of a really large demarcation of Bilal al A lot of them are a little bit small. I don't necessarily include. Um, the Sinai Peninsula or Cyprus. But nevertheless, this idea of Bilal Sham had existed for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years before the British and the French came in to divide the territory. Now, while a lot of us here in the US maybe never heard of Bilal Sham, for the Palestinian Syrian refugees I met, this was an integral part of their history and they remembered it and it was still important to so many of them, not all of them, but a lot of them still had this memory of this particular territory as a central part of understanding their identity and their place in the world. So I'll give you a couple of examples, um, some translated quotes I have here. This one from a Syrian woman who says, it was Britain's fault. They separated Bilal Sham. The Western world has convinced us, and later on she goes on to say, the Western world has convinced us that borders are necessary. Because in her mind, in her past, this was not a necessary thing to have these borders. Likewise, a Palestinian man told me, if we go back to the past, it was one country known as Bilal Sham. It was only later that we were divided into many countries like Palestine and Jordan. But what's really important about this is not only do the refugees that I met talk very often about recognizing this past, this difference, that uh, territory difference that had existed before the fall of the Ottoman Empire, it also very powerfully had an effect on their sense of belonging and again, also their choices about migration. So a Syrian man talks about how Bilal al-Sham without today's borders is my homeland. And that word homeland gets used a lot in the interviews that I, I did. Um, he goes on to say, Palestine, Jordan, Syria, and Iraq are all my countries. They are all my brothers and they are all the same. A Palestinian woman told me a slightly different way, but told me kind of similar sentiment. I want the borders demolished so that my homeland can be united again as they were before the war. And that war meaning World War I, not the current Syrian war. And these are just these are just a couple examples. I have so many, so many, so many other interviews that people said incredibly similar things to this. Okay, sorry, I went a little too quickly there. So just kind of wrap up here that um, these imaginings, their senses of belonging, these have had direct effects on their movements as well as even Jordanian policy, but that's a different chapter. Uh, the sense that these lands and people are connected and united has been a major reason why people have decided to move to Jordan and then to actually stay in Jordan. Because in Jordan, Syrians and Palestinians feel that they have a very shared history and cultural practices that make them get feel like they belong and that they are often within their homeland, a word that was used very frequently in the interviews. So just to summarize, refugees, Palestinian Syrian refugees in Jordan, they basically have moved from one post-colonial state to another. They have crossed these imperial imposed borders that have existed for less than 100 years, and they continue today to imagine a different territory and a different homeland from the one that we're accustomed to seeing on political maps. So let me just end by thanking uh, the West Virginia University Humanities Center so much for their support. Uh, began this book project in the spring of 2017. I'm kind of embarrassed to admit that. Um, but I picked up speed this summer in great part thanks to their support uh, for the financial assistance, but also just for the mind space to know I am focusing only on this this summer. It was fantastic and it made an incredible amount of progress this summer. So much to say that I actually just yesterday finished the first full draft of my manuscript. Yay, I know. <laughs> and um, I'm in the process of doing this kind of editing to it right now. And my editor, I have a contract at the University of Chicago, my editor will have the book on April, or my first draft on April 30th. So it's coming. It's taken a long time, but it is coming. And I get Thank very much the center for that.
And that's it. I'm done. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Karen. And that's so exciting. Congratulations. Good. <laughs> it's been slow. It's been really, really slow, but I'm getting there. <laughs> A long birth process. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And um, would you be able to um, uh, move, move out of the screen? Perfect. Great. All right. So thank you to both of our um, fellows. And uh, we're now moving into our collaborative grant space. And um, first, we'll hear from the team of uh, Karen Kunz and Sally Brown, then Melissa Bingman, and then um, Aaron Brock Carlson. And I believe she might be bringing in a student, um, Rachel Hood, who's also worked on her project. So um, first, I'd like to introduce um, Karen and Sally um, uh, with Public Administration in the Libraries and their, their topic here is Undefeated, Canvassing the Politics of Voter Suppression Since Women's Suffrage. So um, it is all yours. Thank you, Rhonda. Um, I just wanna start off by saying that, first of all, I was really excited to be included in this project. It's spectacular and it's, couldn't be more timely. The commemoration of women's suffrage and everything that women went through to ensure the right to vote is juxtaposition between all of the efforts um, now that, that are currently taking place to disenfranchise voters. So it's really interesting to contemplate not just what, not only what women have gone through and, and there are extraordinary exhibits starting with the Library of Congress and the National Portrait Gallery to the amazing exhibit that Sally put together. Um, that really show the importance of, of and, and the, the, the downfalls of voter suppression and the, the challenges to making sure that everyone has the right to vote. So with that, I wanna turn it over to Sally. Thanks, Karen. I'm just gonna share my screen. <clears throat> share. Do you all see where it says undefeated? Should I do this? Is that better? Okay, I'm gonna try to time it with my little talk. So uh, once the Art and the Libraries Committee decided on the topic of voter suppression uh, in 2019, in the anticipation of the suffrage centennial, uh, we gathered together a expert committee, including Karen and 10 other scholars and activists um, across the region to help with the exhibit content and during the artwork one of the more popular forms of suffrage artifacts was the button or the badge. So we decided on that format for the call for work. Artists from across the world submit exhibit designs. About 200 were submit. So students and faculty in various courses from education to marketing, public administration, history and multidisciplinary studies also helped develop many exhibits and phrases for voter suppression that would inspire designs by graphic design students that are also included in the exhibit. Due to COVID, we launched the online version with all of the accepted artwork, about 80 works, and full longer content, articles written by the committee, the expert committee of regional activists and scholars, in each of the themes that I'll get to in a minute. Thereafter, our print designer, Eve Balks, who is a, a professor of graphic design at WVU, is very passionate about social justice design took on the task of designing the downtown campus library space, which you're looking at now. She really took the role seriously and developed really dynamic, interactive and informative designs for each theme and abbreviated and updated informational content. As you can imagine with the election, information was changing about daily. So themes to the exhibit include a brief history of the button as it pertained to suffrage, the significance of suffrage and bikes, a suffrage and voter timeline, then contemporary topics around voter turnout, disinformation, access and intimidation, legal issues, ways to take action. Within these greater themes were sub themes, gerrymandering, you can see there, Jim Crow laws, voter fraud, voter ID laws, voter voting rights, disenfranchisement, voting in the time of COVID and student voting. The online exhibit also includes a libguide with resources for each theme. I talked a little bit too fast. So I'm about to talk about <laughs> the Jim Crow section, which I think is in, here it is. 
you can see the design for the panels around Jim Crow laws, just as, as an example. So Jim Crow, Crow was initially a fictional minstrel character, you can see the illustration depicted there on the left, used to cruelly caricature black slaves in the early 1800s and became the blanket term for anti-black laws in the South and some border states between 1877 and 1960s. The laws excluded African-Americans from certain facilities and institutions prevented, and prevented them from gaining political power and forced them into inferior positions in society of which implications are looming today. This text was written by Danielle Emerling, one of the experts on the committee, who is the Congressional and Political Papers Archivist for the West Virginia and Regional History Center. She also curated a concurrent exhibition um, along with Undefeated called For the Dignity of Man and the Destiny of Democracy, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. So as you can see, the text is complemented uh, with the illustration of Jim Crow, as well as design by artists, contextualize the, the contextualizing the information and data with multiple perspectives. We also have a few interactive elements using the bike wheel, again, the circular form, as well as the significance of bikes to, voter, uh, to voting as a mode of transportation. There are various bike wheels throughout the exhibit at the downtown campus library that pose questions where viewers can post responses with their own sticky note. See it right there. How do you think Gen Z will affect changes to election laws? So along with the print and online exhibit, we partnered with a West Virginia Women Vote Coalition to present several virtual programs around, around various suffrage and voter suppression topics, which are all available for viewing and sharing on our YouTube channel for Art in the Libraries. This project was a large and important undertaking with multiple humanities themes as discussed and seen here. Thanks to this collaborative grant with the Humanities Center, we were able to make this possible and the exhibit designs are documented in the WVU Research Report repository as well as the online exhibit and virtual programs. So I encourage you to check it out if you can. And also, like I said, this is the virtual tour on our YouTube page with all the designs. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's, so, so it looked like you had student interaction too. That was great. Um, so our next uh, uh, awardee is Melissa Bingman, and she is from the Department of History, and she'll be talking about uh, Pocahontas County audio document, uh, documentary that she's working on. Great, thank you. Um, I thought I'd give a broader overview of what our work has been in Pocahontas County. So at this point, this is a five year project um, that um, is designed to help students and the public history program get involved with the 200th anniversary of Pocahontas County. So I got involved in Pocahontas County probably about 2011, 2012 through a project called Traveling 219. And what this was, it was an initiative um, to kind of bring to life some of the stories in the Federal Writers Project from the 1930s that did not actually end up in the, the traveling book. Um, so it's uh, GIS based and there's the kind of wanted to recreate oral histories, but also to kind of pull some of these, these stories, these nuggets from the Federal Writers Project. So I had prior history working with Pocahontas County um, and when they started planning for their 200th anniversary, which will be coming up in 2021, we were approached by um, a man who's a volunteer, an activist, a historian, started Allegheny Mountain Radio, and I thought it was perfect for the public history program because one of the goals of the, the main intro public history research methods class is to give students a taste of how to conduct research and what it's like to conduct research for an outside client or when your research question or narrative is driven from outside of the academy by a community, an employer, a client, um, whatever. So in this case, the client was the Pocahontas County 200th Anniversary Commission. Um, so in the first year we, I tackled this project, um, just kind of did a survey of the narratives in Pocahontas County, what's out there. There's three kind of these traditional county histories. And of course I knew that there was a lot of great information in the Federal Writers Project. 
So the first year students came up with some interpretive themes and they developed a logo. I don't think this is the exact logo that they came up with, um, but some of the themes that they wanted communicated, um, I think ended up in this, this logo. Um, and from there, what I did was I just tasked students with everybody, you can choose any topic that you want in Pocahontas County. Um, Here's what we know about the research. Here are some interpretive themes. Um, we usually have someone from the commission come in to talk about you know, what their vision is for the 200th anniversary. Um, but they were great to work with because they're open to anything. So the students, I gave them free reign just to come up with whatever topics they wanted, but then also to think about the topic that they chose, what is the best way to communicate that topic? And we talked about some of the ways that history is presented um, to public audiences. Of course, the main way is everyone thinks about first, I think, are museum exhibits. And it's, of course, we did a museum exhibit. Um, that's the timber exhibit that's on display at the Watts Museum. And we'll travel to Pocahontas County, which was also funded by a WV Humanity Center grant. Um, but really think about what, what kind of resources do you need for an exhibit? What kind of narratives work well for exhibit? And not just rely on the exhibit as the main way to tell your story. Um, so some of the other ways are roadside markers. I'm sure you've all seen them, cast in aluminum. Those need to be place-based. Waysides, those are outdoor signs that are like you might see at the park service. Again, place-based narratives. Um, there's also national register nominations um, for historic buildings. There's, we hope to, that we will have a few of those out of Pocahont for Pocahontas County. Um, there's also the, West, the Journal of West Virginia History and Golden Seal. And there's certain narratives or certain um, historical research that will lend themselves better to one or the other. So they were tasked with coming up with a topic that um, is significant and translated to one of these um, methods of communication. Or, you know, some students, I said, if you can think of an idea of your own, fantastic, of how you wanna, what, what could work for the bicentennial. And one student thought of coming up with a bicentennial quilt program and they jumped on that right away. So that's on their website, that's early on, they're implementing that program right away. Um, so as the, as the years went on, um, I got better at thinking, how, how do we help students find these topics? So we started going down to Pocahontas County. Um, and this is where students really started to get ideas, um, either by looking at the physical space around them or talking to residents and people in the area. So for example, um, one year some of the students went to church and that's where she got her idea. Um, they just introduced them, they were asked to introduce themselves. They said they're from WVU and they were doing just research. What do people wanna know about the history of Pocahontas County? And she did a topic on Minnehaha Springs that's down there. So um, we got, as the years went on, we got better about, you know, how do you really engage with community and this place-based narrative to get your ideas for your topics. Let me see here. So ultimately, here is what we will end up after five years. We're going into their um, the start of their bicentennial year. We do have this traveling exhibit um, that came out of one of the themes, and then just the idea that the there's I don't know if any of you have been to Cass, but that is in Pocahontas County, and it's it's a wonderful site. There's so much of the physical landscape intact, um, but they could use some help with their interpretation. And it's all told through music. It's amazing. Um, you can see it at the Watts Museum now. We will have an entire issue of the Journal of West Virginia History that's devoted to Pocahontas County. We'll also have an issue of Golden Seal. Um, and if, for those of you that don't know the difference between the two, the Journal of West Virginia History is more your traditional academic journal um, with footnotes and an argument and original research, where Golden Seal is more of a magazine with lots of photographs and it's really personal stories. So some of the, pro the, the narrative lends itself better to Golden Seal than it does the Journal of West Virginia History. Um, we hope to have seven podcasts, um, three waysides and educational exhibits. And you'll be glad to know, oops, I meant this, we apply to the West Virginia Humanities Council, not the center for this one. So we're trying not to burden um, Rhonda with all of our asks for money. Um, <laughs> and hopefully one to two national register nominations. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about the podcasts so this project for the West Virginia WVU Humanities Center Collaborative Grant, um, the collaborators are Jesse Wright and the Reed School of Media, 
course, the Pocahontas County Bicentennial Commission and Allegheny Mountain Radio. And the reason I thought podcasts would work so well for Pocahontas County is they have a strong history of radio in the area. So Gibbs Kinderman, he kind of started this Allegheny Mountain, this shortwave radio that can reach residents in Pocahontas County. So they're very into this kind of um, audio narrative. And then I was at a conference and I saw how New Orleans for their 300th anniversary did a project called Tripod. And it was a collaboration between a radio station and archives and historical society. And it was just brilliant. So I kind of, you know, from studying Tripod understood what kind of narrative works well for a podcast, what makes a good historical podcast. But Jesse Wright is key to this partnership. And he had come in, he's come to speak to my class before, but he recently joined um, the Reed School of Media and faculty. And the main thing I needed to know from him was what is it that history students can do? Like I know they can research and come up with narrative and understand um, what kind of narrative works well for a podcast, but can they edit, can they produce, do they collect their own sound? So he's been instrumental in kind of guiding us to the process of who we need to hire. So with this grant, we were able to hire a producer um, so that their research can actually be translated into a podcast. So in coming up with some of the topics, um, below is just a list of what the podcast will be about. The students really had to think about, um, you know, where can they do sound collection? Actually, podcasts are very place-based as well. And you wanna, you know, set people in the place that you're exploring. So there needs to be a place-based angle. Um, it's ideal if you can interview someone that was there at the time. And if you can't, then to think about um, who else can you interview that can give a personal story about um, whatever topic you're thinking about. So of course, no one is, well, I don't think there is anyone still living from the 1918-1920 pandemic, um, but there's certainly people who have experienced this latest pandemic in Pocahontas County. Um, I will say the Watoga Land Association, this was serendipity because um, it was just, I, I'm telling you one sentence line in like a three page exhibit label in the Pocahontas County Historical Society about this African-American separatist community. And the only reason I picked up on it is because we had just had a presentation from a candidate who has now joined our faculty. Thank you, Dr. Jennifer Thornton, who wrote her dissertation on this. So again, this collaboration really spans much broader um, it's all the students over the years, many people in Pocahontas County, um, and then everyone on faculty that I have roped into um, participating in this project. I think the main outcomes are is I, we have a, a pretty good model for working this, this idea that you kind of swoop into one county, do an assessment and work you know, over many years over time with one county to develop these narratives, I think works well. I definitely would would do this again. And, um, you know, in public history, we want all the students to have a hands-on experience that's, that's real. It's not just a classroom exercise. To do that, students need to work beyond the semester. And sometimes we can incorporate these bigger projects into other classes, but mostly we've been using West Virginia um, University Humanities Center grant money to pay graduate students so they can continue on with their projects. So these can actually, be implemented and not just be a classroom exercise. So we are very thankful um, for the funding that we have received. Thank you, Melissa. It's an exciting project, five years in the making. <laughs> very long one there. All right, and um, our final presentation of the evening is Erin um, Carlson of the Department of English, and she was working with Martina Caretta, who was formerly in the uh, Department of Geology and Geography, and um, also their student, Rachel Hood, who is with us today, and they will be talking about supporting community capacity building against extractive interests through place-based narrative, um, visual and narrative inquiry. So, um, all yours. I know it's a mouthful. Thank you, Rhonda. I was dreading saying it. So thank you for like <laughs> doing it for me. Um, so thanks y'all for being here, especially on a Thursday evening, end of the week and a semester that um, never seems to really end. So thank you. Um, so 
tonight we're gonna to be talking about pipeline development. Um, so it was, um, as Rhonda said, myself, Martina Kreta, who is now in a position in Sweden. And so it's 1 a.m. her time, so she will not be joining us. Um, and we worked with the Ohio Valley Environmental Coalition with Vivian Stockman, who directs that. And then Rachel Hood is an MA student in geography and they are with us tonight. So. Okay, let me start my timer here. All right, so you'll see some photos throughout this presentation that are all from participants in the project. And I'll talk a bit more about um, how we got those photos and sort of the methodology behind it. But you'll just, so I won't talk about all of them, but you'll just be able to see sort of some of these moments that have been captured by people living in close proximity to pipeline development. So I wanted to start by talking a bit about the shared interests at the core of this project. You know, um, I'm a I'm in the English department. My specialty is technical and professional communication, and so I'm really interested in how um, place, as many of us on this panel seem to be focused on place, um, how place factors into uh, really complex public problems. And Martina is a feminist geographer, so we kind of came together. So we have this really keen um, understanding of how place is really important, and not only how problems sort of manifest, but how we discuss problems, how we try to solve or address problems. Um, we both work with narrative and visual research methods. So one of the methods we used in this project is photo voice, which I'll talk a bit more about on the next slide. And that's um, a methodology that I've used for several projects. Um, and finally, we both um, work with community organizers in Appalachia and both, you know, at the time, both being in West Virginia, this was a really good opportunity for us to team up um, in, in find ways to connect with uh, local community members dealing with this um, infrastructural build out. So really the aim of this project was to explore local residents' lives alongside um, pipeline development in order to document the experiences, sorry, all the Zoom stuff is like in front of my slide. So experiences of communities that often get um, ignored or overlooked. So when we talk about pipeline development, the discourse seems to be really dominated by like economic conversations, right? What is the economic impact? Um, how many jobs are being created or it's really focused on the environmental impact um, or you know political conversations and while all of those are there's no one lens that we should only be taking it's all nuanced and interlaced and complex and so with that looking you know trying to talk to and document and capture the lived experiences of people actually living next to these like vast infrastructural like you know petrochemical complexes or a pipeline coming very close to your home like those moments are what capture how all of this stuff kind of intertwines so that's what we were trying to do with this project so last summer with funding from the Humanities Center, um, we conducted 31 safely conducted um, walk along interviews, um, masked social distanced um, around the Eastern Panhandle, West Virginia and in central um, West Virginia. So we went to Doddridge County, like Doddridge was kind of, it's, you know, it's like the seat of oil and gas um, in the state. So we spent a lot of time in Doddridge, uh, Doddridge um, Braxton, Wetzel County, that, that area. And so we also collected 300 photos. Um, oh, and I'm sorry. So these interviews were walk-along interviews. So folks walked us along their property, showed us where the pipeline had come through, showed us any sort of um, changes in the landscape, that sort of thing. Um, and this particular picture, which Rachel took, thank you, Rachel, um, was in a uh, black cemetery um, that had not been like had not been really on the books. Um, and then there was, there's like a, a complex, I can't, it's, um, and Rachel, you can jump in if you remember, if you Rockwell. can. Yes, Rockwell, thank you. Um, which is a, a, you know, like chemical manufacturing uh, plant, plastics and, and um, ceramics and things like that. But anyway, really close to this, they were gonna do a feeder line through the black cemetery. And so, you know, the community mobilized and, had to work really hard to try and save this this site and so um so walk along interviews and then we also did photo voice which is a methodology where people take pictures of their daily lives and then we use the photos as data but also as sites for reflection and collaborative meaning making and so um participants took photos leading up to our visits and then during the visits um or during the interviews they would show us the photos and we they would tell us what they meant and sort of like talk through them 
And then in the fall, um, we did a survey in a virtual focus group to confirm and validate the findings. And that's kind of outside of what the, the funding from the Humanity Center did, but I wanted to show that like the Humanity Center allowed us to start this project and it's been like a really rich and robust um, collaboration. So Rachel will tell us a bit about the major themes. Yeah, so these are some of the major themes and narratives that came out of those interviews. Um, one being identity. So how does someone's, you know, various identities impact how they see the pipeline or how they're affected by the pipeline? How do they perceive other people who don't have those same identities and their reactions to the pipeline? How is the pipeline affecting how they see themselves and how they see their community? another sense of home. Um, <clears throat> so this was a really emotional topic about people really grappling with whether they're gonna stay in their home, whether they can raise their children where they thought they would raise their children. Um, you know, investing so much time and like love into a place that is then seemingly taken and turned into something else. Um, another is information education. So where are people learning about this and how are they being communicated with? There's a great quote about um, the emergency number you call if you think that there's a leak and the guy's like, oh yeah, that 1-800 number, it's a great recording. Um, yeah, so, so many people told us they did not have a direct contact after construction was finished. There's a 1-800 number and that's it. So if something goes wrong, it's like a 1-800 number or 911 and that's, that's what you got. Yeah. Um, and so also looking at like what community groups or other other sources of information are filling in and how have people developed networks to get information when governing bodies or the companies are not giving it to them. Documents and communication, which is obviously Aaron's forte, was another theme. Um, so looking at maps, looking at easement records, looking at um, documents from the company, those sorts of things. Um, and Aaron, feel free to jump in on that one. But the last one is experts and expertise. So looking at the very rich, um, very important place-based knowledge that people who have lived in West Virginia have about their home and their community and their surrounding area and comparing that to companies and um, people who don't live in the area who think that they can transform the landscape and know what the consequences of that will look like. Yeah, absolutely. So, and you can see some of the pictures on the left side, like I, the middle one I wanted to point out only because um, that gentleman is in Doddridge County and basically like there was this mudslide that came in and you can't, you can see how it's like overtaking the stairs, right? So it's like, there's some of these really like significant things that happen, not directly because of the pipeline, but because of the construction or the barriers that aren't working, things like that, that happen weeks, months after. And so it's like this long, this it dramatically changes people's lives um, beyond construction, right? So that's something really important. So a few, few takeaways, um, and sorry, there's a lot of text on here, but here we are. So the first, the first thing is like the process of pipeline development is really complex. It's very steeped in like legal discourse. And so, so many people have to go out and get a lawyer and so many people can't afford a lawyer. And so there's this, there's a lot of barriers that really prevent people from engaging fully with what's actually happening on their land. Second, um, and Rachel sort of gestured to this, but residents typically learn about pipeline development through their own research. So many people, we would ask them like, okay, well, how did you learn? And it's maybe there's a, a thing in the news or an article in the newspaper, but most of the time it's kind of word of mouth or they get a notice and then they're like, wait, what's happening? And they have to do all of this research on their own time. And that's really intense. And lots of people talked about being really burnt out um, and getting really discouraged after years of doing this and continuing to face the same things. Um, third, landowners and community members experience significant disruption before, during, and after pipeline construction, which I think I think the understanding is like, of course, during construction, it'll be loud or there'll be dust or there'll be traffic. But again, it like it, it's an extensive duration of time that people are dealing with this. And then finally, which to me, I think is sort of the, the biggest takeaway and has been framing a lot of my own thinking is just that 
you know, because of their proximity to pipelines, landowners and community members document their experiences. Like so many people had, like were very practiced in taking photos already because they had to document like what was happening to their land. Um, and they have knowledge that no one else does. And so that lived experience should be valued as situated expertise. So really quickly, it's just like, you know, there are engineers out West who are looking at maps and they have that expertise and they're like, okay, well, the incline's this and we can do this. But then when the crews get out there and start trying to go up and down these steep hillsides, there are slips, there are breakages, there's all this stuff that happens and people that are living there could tell you that, but they're not consulted. And so that, that's like something really significant there. Okay. And Rachel, you can yeah. finish this. Outcomes and, and future work. So Martina and Aaron have already put out articles um, and are continuing to work on articles about storytelling and situated expertise, um, landscape change. Um, they put a piece in the conversation about um, sort of the experiences of having a pipeline as your neighbor. Um, as Aaron mentioned in the beginning, this research is done in collaboration with the Ohio Valley Environmental Coalition, who are campaigning against the Appalachian Storage Hub, which is a massive petrochemical project on the Ohio River Valley. Um, that would be dozens of pipelines and cracker plants and just toxic everything. Um, and there's also plans to develop public facing um, exhibits with the photos. Um, and linking those photos to the narrative. This summer, I'll be conducting interviews um, specifically focused on the emotional impacts of the pipeline and the way that those emotions are felt physically. Um, and so basically linking changes in the landscape to changes in the body. Um, and there's potential to work with other organizations, including the Frack Tracker Alliance and the Ohio Health Registry and the Ohio Health Project um, to continue to um, develop community um, capacity and community organizing using um, this data. So. so thank you. So thank you to the Humanity Center for giving us this opportunity because it started a really great collaboration and I got to work with Rachel and I, I don't think I would have in any other context. So it's been really wonderful. So thank you. Thank you both for sharing your research and um, uh, interesting to see where you're going. So I just wanted to thank you all so much um, for, for all the wonderful work you're doing, for sharing it with us. Um, we officially end in one more minute, <laughs> um, but I wanted to, um, uh, if, if you all are willing to, to stay on for a couple of minutes in case anyone does have any questions here that we can um, field and, and send towards you. Um, Welcome to do that. Um, so while we're doing that, I also wanted to um, just say that uh, that these grants were funded by um, a WVU endowment from the Claude Worthington Benedum Foundation. Uh, so we'd like to thank them. And also um, we are excited to make an announcement. So every year the Humanities Center chooses a theme and this year was public matters and all of your work worked so well in this. Um, and next year, our theme is the Agora. So we're looking forward to this idea of a meeting place, places of, uh, you know, of spaces of meeting and the different things that happen. Where are the places we're meeting now? Clearly we're all here on Zoom. Um, so we um, also would like to uh, look at, um, Think about that in broad context. So if anyone that's uh, still in the audience is interested, you can always uh, drop us information, suggestions for things that you'd like to do or ideas you have for your departments. Um, so uh, Lynn Stahl has just said, thank you all for the wonderful talks. Uh, question for anyone here. Uh, these projects are all invested in place, as I think we've noted. And um, she's curious to know about how the meaning of place has changed for you in the process of doing your research amid a pandemic. So that's we anchored in, di in a different way that we're not used to. So if anyone wants to take that. Rhonda, I would, um, I think what occurred to me and through the pandemic was that the exhibit that Sally put together is it, because of the pandemic and doing it virtually, it's accessible to so many more people 
than um, I think would have had a chance to see it. And because voter issues, voter suppression is such a big deal right now with probably two thirds of the states in the country enacting different laws or proposing different laws. It's so timely that I think it, it really helps to open people's eyes to what the, the importance of, of um, access to, to voting rights is. And I don't think we would have had that coverage or that accessibility had it not been for, for Zoom and virtual, virtual foundations. Anybody else like to jump in on, on how the idea of place maybe has impacted you or thinking about, I know you guys had to do the walk along and six feet away. <laughs> yeah, I was just thinking about that. It's like, you know, doing field work under these circumstances was very strange um, and very, it was, it's kind of clinical in a way, like you're wearing masks, you're outside, you're six feet apart. You're like, we were very careful, you know, and a lot of the people we spoke with were um, also very careful and like maybe a little bit older, but it's like people are sharing such intimate stories about like the way their lives have been uprooted and changed and the frustration going along with this, or even some people had like more positive experiences, but like very intimate stories and that you would expect to be like kind of sitting somewhere like you know and, but you're standing in a field six feet apart and so it like I don't know that this really answers Lynn's question super clearly but just thinking about the ways that like very small things can change the way that you experience a place right um has been something that stuck with me I want to chime in quickly um, you know, country roads experienced kind of a bump during the pandemic that there were lots of folks recording it and posting it online. So there are all of these kind of homemade internet versions, um, filmings of it at nursing homes where people were in quarantine. And um, I, I heard, didn't see this, someone sent me a picture that the lyrics were on the mirrors in the Huntington airport as a hand-washing song. And of course we've used it um, at WVU as a hand-washing song also. So that was interesting, that, that sense of it as a global anthem that's multi-faceted and multi-purpose. Hey, uh Sarah, I will let you know that my children um, hum that while they brush their teeth because that's how long you're supposed to brush your teeth for, <laughs> like washing your hands. So, um, yeah, my um, my thoughts about place and my research um, during COVID, uh, it's really kind of, it's quite different. Um, every aspect of my work just is, you know, it had to be incredibly reflective of my very privileged position as a white American woman with a, you know, a US passport. Um, and doing you know research with people who are struggling and experiencing immense traumas, um, you know it's hard for the researcher, but it's much harder for them, obviously. So there's always that level of discomfort being you know an outsider and the researcher with the you know, American passport. But with COVID, I mean, just like that level of uh, guilt, um, that level of personal just I don't know bewilderment of what do you actually do? What do you do? Like this is. What we really do as humanities scholars and researchers, like how do we, you know, actively working towards fixing other people's problems? Um, it's, it's sometimes it feels, it's a really uphill battle, um, and just understanding and knowing that additional level of complication that people were living with, particularly the ones in like Zatri or Azarak camps, because those camps are very densely populated. Um, and knowing that if they do get sick, they don't have the medical access we have. So for me, the, the place-based element of it in COVID just really highlighted yet again something I was always aware of, but just really that exasperated difference between my wealthy privileged position and their lack of that. So that was, that was kind of the most important thing for me and how COVID just kind of just, you know, maybe realize things I already realized, but in a much more intense way. And that was something I was struck with with many of your projects is, you know, because you're working in various communities, you have various um, you know, stakeholders and, and invested interests is how have you worked and, and over the years, Melissa, you've been working for five years working on books, this takes a long time, but but to do the work ethically, um, what are some of the things that that you've come to as important um, uh, important ways that we look at the work and do the work 
um, and maybe have those changed over time or over these projects? I will say now that we're kind of like towards the end of the project, one of my challenges was now that I have all these discrete narratives that students have kind of chosen a little bit randomly or been inspired by place or talking to somebody, how do you weave them together? Um, and I was surprised at um, where a lot of people said they were interested in history of enslavement in Pocahontas County. No student wrote about it. So I'm like, this is a gap that we have to fill. So luckily, um, had a very strong PhD student in the fall who I asked, would you please kind of weave these together? And it will be a prominent article in the West Virginia Journal of History. So the model always, especially when you're talking about a, an anniversary commemoration or people say, call it a celebration. Um, sometimes it's harder to tackle those, those tougher subjects. I think we have, but again, that's what's nice about having these different mediums, you know, what might not work for a Golden Seal article will work for West Virginia, Journal of West Virginia History. I would just really quickly add something, you know, that I've been thinking a lot about in doing work with Appalachian communities, and then especially has come to the forefront with this project, is just um, how it's not only like natural resources being extracted but i see this with sarah's project too but think about like cultural extraction right and you know as academics we are like doing this research and taking right so it's really important to think about the reciprocity and i'm this is a, a garbled answer because i don't i think about it all the time like i think it's a, an ethical imperative that we're all talking and like grappling with all the time um, is how do we do this work without being extractive or is there even a way to do that right and like how can we how do we reconcile the work that we do with the needs of communities and so it's something that I think I don't know I'd love to talk more with the people on this panel about it because I feel like we all have different things that we could contribute to that conversation but that is just like a metaphor I think that's been really um, stuck in my head and I saw Laura had a question a specific question in here for um, Karen. Yeah, so I'll, I'll read that. Thank, thank you, Aaron um, and, and Melissa. So Laura Farina said, um, great projects, everyone. She has a, a question for um, Karen Kolkassi. In the imagination of um, Bilad, did your interviewees cite temporal markers, eras or dates? Um, or was the narrative mostly about before and after the territorial divide? No, there was never a sense of this was, you know, a specific place that existed at a certain time period and a certain time period. It was more of a, it was more of a political statement. Like they knew with that by invoking this idea of Lad Hashem, which, you know, did exist in the past as certain administrative units of the Ottoman Empire, but then the Ottoman Empire actually dissolved it. Ottoman Empire was in existence for so long that they had lots of different um, evolutions of their different administrative units. But um, no, it was actually like, it was never specifically temporal. It was really just political, like, recognizing it as um, anti-imperial and they knew very much what they were doing. It wasn't just the sense of like, oh, we're going to tell, you know, Dr. a little bit about the history of this place. It was a, a pointedly political statement they were making, which I loved. It was great. Thank you. Something I found very powerful, what you were saying, but also that, that again, like place-based came out is the idea of imaginings and to bring something into being how we have to imagine it and that that creative um, aspect of, of, of who we are. And I think that's something that is so important within the humanities and the, and the work that you all are doing. And so I, I, I really wanted to... Um, um, once again, we're, we're out of time here. I wanted to thank you so much for all of your great projects, for sharing them with us. And I think we have some more ideas for some more, um, you know, some more panels that maybe we have to, to talk about, some of our um, ethical reciprocity and, and imaginings and bringing things into being. And, um, and, uh, and again, uh, Kate Staples says this is wonderful. Thank you all. So can't say it any better. So thank you all. Good night. Um, and uh, we'll see you at the Agora. Bye-bye. <laughs> right. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye.